Hello 9B4. <clears throat> um, so we have now finished the work on inspector calls. Um, well done, done, done to those of you who submitted me work. You've all done really well with that. Um, <clears throat> I'm not sure if you're aware but you actually study inspector calls um, at GCSE. <clears throat> so the work that we put in now, <clears throat> sorry, croaky throat <laughs> will um, really assist you when it comes to studying for your GCSEs as of next year. Now we're going to start looking at poetry for the last few weeks of this term and like Inspector Calls um, the poems that we're going to study are ones that will come up in your GCSE. So we have an anthology of poems that we look at for GCSE. Anthology means a collection of now all of these poems in the anthology that we study as a school are based around the topic of power and conflict or power or conflict. Um, they're a vast uh, array of poems varying from very classical poetry, romanticist poets, uh, sorry, romantic poets, romanticism, <clears throat> more modern poems based on uh, much more recent events. Um, and as we dig through the meaning and the linguistic techniques, I hope that you'll become really fond and familiar um, with, a, with a lot of them. They're, they really are some really nice poems once you really get to grips with what they mean and how the writers have crafted them. So, <clears throat> with that in mind, the first poem we're going to look at is one called Ozymandias, or Ozymandias, however you like to describe um, pronounce it, sorry. What I'd like you to do is have a look at these two images on the screen. Just take a couple of minutes to really think what could these images represent. So the one on the left you have what appears to be the face of somebody lying on the floor. Um, and then on the right you have somebody being pulled down, the statue of somebody being pulled down. So what do these represent? So pause the video, have a think, and then restart when, you, when you've come up with some ideas. So I'm hoping you've come up with some ideas. So we have two images, as we said, of one with, um, on the left that looks like the uh, sculpture of somebody's head that's on the floor. It looks like it's possibly broken, and there's people around it. It's a black and white photograph. And the one on the right is what looks to me like a crane a noosed around a leader's neck and pulling them down off a pedestal. So what might these images represent? So I'm going to propose that maybe they represent that these people were once mighty leaders or people of importance, hence they have a statue of themselves. Um, and maybe the fact that they're now either being pulled down or lying on the floor broken, damaged, represents the fact that they have no longer got that position of power and got that control that they used to have over the people. Um, <clears throat> we don't, we can only hypothesise just simply from images as to who it was that decided to pull them down, but certainly these people that once had power um, now appear not to, or certainly people dislike them gra um, greatly. <clears throat> Which underlines the um, the poem of Ozymandias in, in a lot of ways. So um, today's lesson is going to be, uh, we, we, I'm going to hope, I can't get my words out today. I'd like you to be able to read and understand the poem Ozymandias by the author Percy Bysshe Shelley. So we're going to look at the context surrounding the poem, read the poem itself, really become familiar with it, and consider Shelley's, Percy Shelley's presentation of power. So firstly, who was Percy Shelley? Now this is really important to the poem. So he was born between 1792, sorry, in 1792, and died in a boating accident just before his 30th birthday. So he died very young and he, he died in, 18, in 1822. So this was in Italy, I believe, that he had an accident. Uh, where he was away with his wife Mary Shelley, who was actually the writer of Frankenstein. Um, and now he lived in a rapidly changing Britain at the time, <clears throat> so we were just on the cusp of the Industrial Revolution. 
So when people were moving from the countryside, you probably will remember this from your year seven history, moving from the countryside into large urban areas, lot, lots um, of people moved to cities such as Manchester, Birmingham, Bolton, London, Leeds, Liverpool, and they moved there for work. So their jobs in the countryside in agriculture and farming were becoming much harder. Um, so it was much harder to earn money doing that job. And there just wasn't the same work there because of the way that farming was becoming mechanized. Um, and because of the evolution of uh, uh, engineering and technology at the time, um, there were much more jobs being uh, created in these large cities for these people to go and earn money. Not a lot of money, but you need money to, to, live, to live and feed your family. So the Industrial Revolution was going on in Britain and just over the channel in France, they were just going through the French Revolution. So in France, <clears throat> they lived in a society that was very you know, if you were rich, if you were part of the elite or the bourgeoisie, as they were known, you very much had a life of luxury. It was, they were very much takers, not givers. And most of France were incredibly poor. So there were much less um, inhabitants in France that lived in that in-between area. So in Britain, we had the very, very rich upper classes. We had some middle classes and we had a lot and lot of poor people whereas in France there was quite a lot of very rich people in comparison to Britain but a vast vast number more of poor people than we had um, now the bourgeoisie so who were these very rich um, French families lived in chateaus you've probably seen images of them that look like fairy tale castles they had plenty of staff and servants butlers lived a very luxurious lifestyle. Um, now the poorer people in France decided that enough was enough, they didn't like to be ruled and governed this way, they didn't like the fact that they had nothing and these people lived a life of luxury. So they actually revolted, had a revolution and overthrew the bourgeoisie so they kicked out all of these very rich French families, um, overthrew the, um, you might have heard of people like uh, King Louis, and Queen Marie Antoinette, so they got rid of them. Uh, with the guillotine, you've probably seen images of that, like a very big blade that they pull up and then let go of and it tumbles down and chops your head off. Um, so lots of things changing, basically, in Britain or very close to Britain. Now he wrote his works and his poems in the style of the Romanticist, mu um, the Romanticist movement which we'll look at in a second. He was anti-establishment, so kind of similar to the French Revolution. He didn't like all these rich people, all these rules, the government. He didn't believe that they were um, there for the good of everybody. He felt that they were just there for the good of the people that had not the have-nots. And he wanted political reform. He wanted to see change in Great Britain. He didn't like the fact that these people that had moved to the big industrial towns were living very poor conditions, minimal wages, working extremely long hours, children were working in the factories. Um, he really didn't believe that the way that Great Britain was going was, was the right way. He wanted more democracy, so he wanted more people to be able to have the say and have the vote. We know that women couldn't vote before the early uh, 1900s. Well, in the same sense at this time, unless you were a fairly wealthy man, you couldn't vote either. So if you were poor, you wouldn't be able to vote. <coughs> He wanted people to have more freedom, less oppression, and he hated the disparity between the classes. So as we've just said, he really despised the fact that if you had had money, had wealth, you lived a completely different lifestyle from the poor. And there wasn't any what we call social mobility. So whereas now, if you um, have very little financially, it is possible to progress um, with hard work, with luck, with um, generous help from other people, you can progress up the financial scales and then therefore you might consider yourself more wealthy, um, more upper class maybe, if we want to talk in terms of classes, which we don't really do now. Whereas then that, that really wasn't the case. So if, if you were poor, you'd probably be born poor 
and much, much more likely than not, you will die poor. And he promoted atheism. So if you're an atheist, you don't believe in God. You don't believe in religion. You just believe in the natural world and the way that life is now. You don't believe that there might be a God, that there might be a bigger power. So these were his beliefs and the context of the world that he was living in. And they really influence how he wrote, what he wrote about and how he lived his life. So we touched on there that Shelley was something called a romantic poem or he wrote in the style of romanticism. Now romanticism was actually a poetic movement. It was also a movement in literature in general, in the arts, in culture, <coughs> in music. And it came about in the late 18th and early 19th century. So the late 1700s and early 1900s, 1800s, sorry. And romanticism turned towards nature and the interior world of feeling. So looking inside yourself, how do you feel? How does something make you feel? Um, how does that influence the world around you? And it was in direct opposition to the mannered formalisation and disciplined scientific inquiry of the Enlightenment era that preceded it. Now that sounds quite complicated, but what it basically means is prior to this romanticism movement, so the uh, late 1700s, early 1800s, was a period that we might refer to as the Enlightenment era. So it was where technology was beginning to advance. Um, lots of scholars were coming up with new ideas. Um, they, you know, considered that many things need to be scientifically tested, that things should be formal and should be just done in a certain way. Um, and he, he, believed that the, he believed that this was too oppressive too formal and he wanted to free the world up a little bit and really consider well what's going on in the nat in nature around us and what's what do our feelings tell us and, and how we think so some other english poets such as williams wordsworth samuel coleridge john keats shelley who we're looking at william blake and lord byron all produce work that express spontaneous feelings um, and they found parallels to their own emotional lives in the natural world and celebrated creativity rather than logic. So, and some images there that are sort of part of very famous romantic um, paintings. So what I'd like to do now is read the poem through. So I'm going to read it first, then I'm going to play you an animation of the poem. Then I'd like you to pause the video, read through it, a second time so or a third time if we count the animation and then consider these questions below so question three uh, who do you hear in the voice of the poem so who do you think it is speaking in the poem what story do you see in the narrative so what is the poem telling us so if I read through first so Ozymandias I met a traveler from an antique land who said Two vast and trunkless legs of stone stand in the desert. Near them, on the sand, half sunk a shattered visage lies, whose frown and wrinkled lip and sneer of cold command tell that it sculpts well those passions, red which yet survive, stamped on these lifeless things, the hand that mocked them, and the heart that fed. And on the pedestal these words appear. My name is Ozymandias, king of kings. Look on my works, ye mighty, and despair. Nothing beside remains, round the decay of that colossal wreck, boundless and bare, the lone and level sands stretch far away. 